we're starting to see some of the effects of the rate hikes impact the consumer. They're saving a lot less, starting to borrow on credit a little bit more. The retail sales numbers are, are kind of messy right now because of generally, I, I think it, it's fair to say that EPS growth expectations is, is trending lower. Starting your route to retirement. Welcome to the Guided Retirement Show. I'm your host, Dean Barber. Today, my special guest is new employee of Modern Wealth Management and CFA, Stephen Tuckwood, a.k.a. Tuck. Stephen is going to talk to us about proper portfolio construction, about risk in the portfolio, and about how a good CFP with access to a CFA can make a real difference in your portfolio. Please enjoy my conversation with Stephen Tuckwood. All right, Stephen Tuckwood, CFA, welcome to the Guided Retirement Show and welcome to Modern Wealth Management. Great to have you here. Thanks, Dean. Appreciate you having me on the show. Absolutely. So, Stephen, let's uh, let's get started off here by talking about a little bit before we get into what is a CFA, why it's critical that a CFP be able to work with a CFA. Share with our audience a little bit of your background and maybe start with the firm that you worked for years ago that was sold to another firm and then sold to another firm. And what kind of role did that play? And what did that teach you when it comes to how a financial planner or a CFP really needs to have good communication with a CFA? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, my I guess my origin story of the getting into the industry, it was actually back in 2008. I was hired by a, an uh, independent RIA firm here in Atlanta. Um, and it was, as you know, right in the middle of the financial crisis. So it was a, really a front seat to to that debacle unwinding. And um, they'd, they'd brought me on board to help navigate the company through that and to help um, with client portfolios and the management of. Um, so, you know, that was, that was my first introduction to the RIA space, and um, it was obviously a difficult time for everybody, um, but we were able to get through that. Um, a few years later after that, the two partners there uh, decided to join United Capital, which was a, a larger nationwide RIA firm, and um, we made that transition. And then I was recruited to join the corporate team for United Capital um, based in Dallas, where we were uh, charged with building out a, a centralized investment platform for the broader organization. So uh, we was in a team of maybe 15, 16 people um, developing a centralized investment platform, um, bringing on new strategies, closing down some others, um, but uh, working there as really a, a resource for the nationwide advisor base. So as you were doing that, and then that was just kind of your new into the RA business, and then you get to United Capital, you're building out this team of individuals, or you're joining a team of individuals to support the certified financial planners and the advisors that are in direct contact with the clients. What what was it uh, in that role, Stephen, that actually allowed you to maybe have an aha moment of how critical it is that a CFP have direct access to a CFA or somebody that spends all of their time focusing on the investments? Yeah, I think, um, you know, keeping up to date with the markets, I think everybody does a really good job of that. But when it comes to really interpreting what something might mean or um, a tactical change in a portfolio, it might not always be that obvious uh, to everybody. So I think, um, you know, having a resource of a CFA to, to lean upon, um, especially introducing new strategies into a portfolio, what are the effects going to be on the rest of the portfolio, what are the upsides, but more importantly, what are the drawbacks? Um, every different investment strategy does have a, a drawback, and it's important to really recognize what that is at the onset and, and how, the, uh, how that might interact with other positions in the portfolio. So I, th I think a, a CFA does a, a reasonably good job at identifying those types of things making them reasonably clear up front with the, the CFP. And then the CFPs just do a fantastic job, in my experience, of communicating that to the client in a way that they can understand. Now, there are a lot of 
good, what I'll call good financial planners out there, good CFPs, but they're part of organizations where they may not have direct access to a CFA or a team of CFAs that are right there as part of the organization. What are some of the things that you see that could be a little bit of a drawback to that? I mean, I know there's a lot of wholesalers out there that want to come in and talk to you about the programs that they're doing, but I guess talk a little bit about the deep dive analysis that you as a CFA will do and the due diligence that you will do in keeping up with all of the multiple uh, different offerings that are out there today to kind of find that needle in the haystack, if you will, the gems that uh, are, are really a cut above the rest. Yeah. Well, you'll notice that uh, a wholesaler will only ever come knocking on your door when they've just had a good run of performance. And that tends to be the case uh, quite often. So it's, uh, you know, really moving the analysis past just past performance, track record, and really understanding what it is that uh, that team of um, investment managers are, are trying to achieve and, and how they're doing that. And if it's sustainable, if it's repeatable, um, these are the, some of the things that we're looking to really assess as we're reviewing different investment managers and different products that we might make available to clients. Um, oftentimes too, some of the, some, some really great investment solutions might be a younger firm that's not been around as long, might not have as long a track record, but the team in place have had great success at a prior firm and have, have been a lift out. Um, so there's those types of situations where it's not always straightforward in terms of identifying who's good at doing any particular task. Um, you know, meeting with them face to face is often uh, a, a really good idea in terms of the investment decision makers themselves and not just the good storytellers that uh, you know you tend to meet with on a on a first kind of sales pitch. Um, so yeah, those, those are the few things that uh, it's important to be aware of when looking at any new investment solution. Stephen, you and I talked before we started the program today about emotions and about how a lot of times people will allow emotions to drive decisions and. Being a financial advisor myself for 37 years, I know that's been one of my biggest challenges is to help people take the emotion out of investing, yet you have to do that on a daily basis. So how do you take emotion out of the decision-making process when it comes to building a solid portfolio for a client? Yeah, it's uh, it's difficult. It's perhaps the, the most difficult thing to do because it is such uh an emotional event to be managing other people's money. And um, it's, uh, but, but it is critical. That, that's where we see most errors being made. And frankly, I think one of the biggest benefits of having a financial advisor as opposed to managing your own money is that it does help to do that, just having it one step removed. Um, you know, the, the CFAs on staff are then essentially another step removed from the advisor as well. So I think that does help in that situation. Um, but uh, yeah, some of these behavioral characteristics are, are the hardest things to overcome um, because it, the easy decision is often the wrong one in either times of despair, times of trouble, market bottoms. It's the easiest thing to do is to de-risk a portfolio when you've just had a large drawdown. Uh, equally to de-risk a portfolio on the upside when things are going so well, you want to be part of that um, market appreciation to take money off the table feels very hard. Uh, the easy thing is to let things ride. Um, so yeah, it, it, controlling emotions, trying to cover that out of the investment decision-making process is really critical for long-term success. Stephen, we're just off the heels of 2022, and uh, we're recording this in the second quarter of 2023 here. And a lot of people look back at the first quarter of 2023 and they saw a nice rebound in the NASDAQ. They saw a nice rebound in the S&P 500. Dow which was the really the star performer last year, not losing as much as some of the other indexes. I think the fear of missing out, a lot of people look at what happened in the first quarter and say, well, okay, is it over? Is this now the beginning of the next bull market? And of course, nobody knows the answer to that until 
it's behind us, but I'd love to get your thoughts as a CFA on the series of rate hikes that Jerome Powell uh, put in place at an unprecedented pace throughout 2022 and continued in the first part of 2023. And perhaps we've got one more rate hike ahead of us here. What is your opinion on, first of all, whether or not the turmoil in the markets is behind us and we've got clear sailing ahead? And then second of all, did Jerome Powell and the rest of the members of the Federal Reserve do a good job or did they go too far? So two great questions there for you to, to tackle. And I know that everybody's going to want to hear your answer. Yeah, difficult questions for sure. Um, the, the first one, I'd say that um, a lot of the trouble has passed in some markets, and but it's still there as a, as a potential to kind of reignite in a few others. Um, so I think 2022 was an exception, not because there was a drawdown in the equity market. You know, we, we've actually had quite a few of those and it should be expected. They're somewhat natural in that it is quite a risky asset to be in public equities, but rather on the fixed income side and treasuries in particular, which are have been in, in common portfolio construction, rarely the ballast of the portfolio during difficult times, because of 2022 and the rate hikes that you mentioned, Dean, being unprecedented the way they were and the way that rates just shot up, um, that side of the portfolio took almost as equal of a hit as on the public equity side, which made a really, really tough year for a 60-40 portfolio, you know, a standard uh, equity fixed income mix. Um, so I think that was um, what made last year particularly hard on everybody. I think that's now changed in that um, duration or the, which is the sensitivity of the price of fixed income to interest rates. I think that's now becoming our friend again in a portfolio. So we had that almost reset year in, in 2022 where it didn't act the way it has historically. And it, it just re was, became really painful for any diversified portfolio. I feel like that has started to shift, uh, just given the rate move, um, we could expect additional rate hikes this year, perhaps maybe maybe one more, maybe two more, something like that. But are we going to have another year of unprecedented rate hikes that we had in 2022? Not, not likely. So that means that um, fixed income has become a potentially safer place to, to park money again. It's become a friend of the portfolio. Um, on the equity side, also a big drawdown, but, uh, but yeah, it, it's always hard to predict um, what might be going on there. Two of the biggest drivers that I look at in terms of equity market performance are financial conditions or specifically the rate of change of, of financial conditions and then the rate of change of earnings growth. A lot of things factor into those two kind of broad metrics, but those are the real two things that move the needle. And um, the first one, you know, a big component of financial conditions is the is the Federal Reserve and what they're doing either with their balance sheet or with the uh, federal funds rate. And, you know, that doesn't look like it's going to be helpful over the next year or so. I don't predict that there's going to be rate cuts um, this year, like some of the market is predicting. Uh, so, we, so we don't have that. We also have the uh, regional uh, bank crisis that we're working through right now. That's not great for financial conditions in terms of lenders tightening um, lending standards across the board and uh, shoring up their own balance sheets. That's not particularly accommodative to risk assets. Um, so you have those two things. And then earnings per share on the S&P 500 looks to be challenged this year. Um, you know, there's forecasts already out for next year there, and it looks to be turning. That might be a little bit more resilient, I think, than expectations, uh, which will help you know, put a, a little bit of a floor into the market. But um, anyway, in summary there, in terms of the, the equity market, the, the two major drivers of potential surprises on the upside, you know, I just don't think are going to be there. So it's really a case of, you know, what can hurt us on the way down, what can impact things uh, to, to give us a big drawdown. And it, we just never know what those will be. You could have, we could have had the same conversation about a year ago prior to Russia invading Ukraine. You know, there's just no way to predict a lot of these 
exogenous effects that can come but all we can do is you know be thoughtful in how we think about things and where should we be positioning uh, risk in the portfolio and um you know we, i suppose we can get onto some maybe portfolio position a little bit but yeah so if you were to say kind of summarize maybe what you're saying there is that um there could be a bit of a tailwind for fixed income um and a bit more of a headwind for equity assets through the balance of this year. Did I, I mean, I can summarize it in something simple like that. Yes. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Yeah, exactly. All right. right. And, so, and the so, starting, starting rates on, on the fixed income side, just to round that out, you know, they're materially higher. So you, you're getting paid a lot more just to hold bonds, uh, which is historically been the largest portion of the returns of, of bonds. Yeah. So let's, you talked about the rate of change um, on a couple of different things. The one that caught my ear was the rate of change of corporate earnings. And I've noticed a deceleration in the rate of change on corporate earnings. Am I reading that correctly? And is that one of the things that concerns you? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. We're, we're starting to see some of the effects of the rate hikes impact the consumer um, where they're, they're saving a lot less, starting to borrow on credit a little bit more, uh, retail sales, you know, it, it's the retail sales numbers are, are kind of messy right now because of the trailing periods, you know, lockdown, everybody was buying things post lockdown, everybody was buying experiences. So, you know, some of this year over year, uh, look through on some of the retail numbers can be a little murky, but generally I, I think it, it's fair to say that. EPS growth expectations is, is trending lower. Um, th now, there's always the potential for a surprise and, and the turn in that. And the equity market often bottoms out well ahead of a turn in EPS growth uh, and its per share growth of the broader market. Um, so, you know, it's really a, a tricky one to get the timing anywhere near correct on that just because the equity market can be so forward looking. And a lot of these companies are making adjustments now. So there you'll see a lot of headlines of a lot of cost cutting in terms of, um, you know, employees getting laid off across the board. Um, really companies trying to shore up their margins. Um, some of the input costs have, are starting to come down as inflation is starting to wane. So they've got that as uh, a potential um, factor to assist there on EPS. So a bit of a mixed bag, but in general, I think you're right, Dean, that, best described as, you know, not a favorable environment right now for earnings growth. Okay. So let's, let's, uh, let's turn to the dirty word that's out there that nobody wants to hear. And that's the word recession. And there are a lot of people that are saying, yes, there is going to be a recession. There are others that are saying, no, there's not going to be a recession. Um, we have it, it, by just about any measure, the most steeply inverted yield curve that I've ever seen. And I don't know that there's one in my 37 years in this industry, I've never seen a yield curve as inverted as it is today. And I don't know if there ever has been one. And that inverted yield curve has typically been a precursor to a recession. And when we couple that with the fact that any interest rate hike that the Federal Reserve does takes months to reach its way into the economy, my opinion is we're not really feeling the effects of those rate hikes, the very significant three-quarter of a point rate hikes that the Fed did four times throughout the summer last year, we haven't felt those yet in the economy. And so the question is, has the Fed gone too far fighting inflation so far that he is going to push the economy into recession? Yeah, uh, potentially. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely uh, on the table as a potential outcome here. I think what we can say definitively is that they were late to the game initially on the rate hikes. You know, the transitory conversation has lasted far too long and they got behind the eight ball. And then now they've obviously embarked on uh, what they did last year in terms of um, unprecedented rate hike cycle. Have they pushed it too far or will they if they raise the rate even further? Um, it, it's hard to say. Um, it doesn't feel like a recession is imminent in terms of the traditional metrics. If you look at the unemployment rate, still quite low. Um, job openings um, is still pretty high versus 
you know, the kind of the potential of the workforce to find a job, it still feels there despite all these more, these broader layoffs. Um, so, you know, whether we enter a technical recession this year or not, I, I don't know. But at the same time, it's almost somewhat, I'd, I'd call it a technical thing if it happened. Uh, you know, the the equity market and the economy aren't always aligned or you know, one is not a signal of another, it, you know, they can get quite divorced from each other. And I think that might be the case here in the, I think the most important thing to focus on is um, earnings growth and the company's ability to adjust in a more difficult market. Um, and if somebody decides to deem this next six months as a technical recession, then, okay, they can do that. But, you know, what matters to us as investors really is the returns on the equity market. So let's get to that, Tuck. I mean, we have, um, and by the way, I called you Tuck. Your name, real name is Stephen Tuckwood, but you go by Tuck. So anybody that's confused when I call you Tuck, they know what I'm talking about now. Um, so let's get to from your standpoint of, or your viewpoint as a CFA, what do you consider the critical components to building a solid portfolio for an individual client? Yeah, I think the first real pillar there of any you know, thoughtful portfolio construction is a is a focus on cost. Um, we can't predict future returns, but what we do know is if we pay more for the same product, we'll have our, our returns be lower than the next person who paid less. So wherever we can try and squeeze out implementation costs, and you can do that in a few ways. Obviously, the more simpler one would be, you know, choosing a more favorable share class within a mutual fund, or even choosing a, an ETF versus a managed product if the manager of a mutual fund is is not being particularly active and it looks and feels more like an index fund. Um, you know, you'd be able to essentially trim some savings there. Um, also, going direct instead of having a um, mutual fund wrapper or an ETF wrapper around your portfolio holdings, you could potentially own them directly um, in your account. That can often reduce some costs involved too. So um, that was a long way of saying the first one, which is be hyper-focused on cost when, you, when you're when you designing portfolios, because that's one of the few variables that we can just be rock solid on that that's in our benefit to do so. Um, the second one I'd say would be to be really open to where you're filling different asset class line items. So, you know, you want to be diversified in terms of having a multi-asset portfolio. In other words, some large cap stocks, a few small cap stocks, some fixed income of various types. Um, the, the best implementation for, for those might come from different places. So not just one fund company to serve all those line items, but really you know, source in the globe, uh, who, who who does one thing particularly well versus others, let's bring those in to, to implement for that particular line item. Um, and then the other is uh, just being really focused on risk, um, w where your bets are being placed, be, you know, cognizant of that. It's not always obvious where they are and uh, having to understand that oh, some of the risk is the, what we call covariance, in CFA terminology, but basically the way that one position might interact with another instead of, you know, you can't just look in isolation in terms of amount of risk to the portfolio from each position, but rather how do they interact with one another? Um, and that's kind of back to the, the 2022 conversation of uh, how the, the treasury line item really uh, decimated 60-40 portfolios. It didn't behave the way it has historically in such a risk-off environment. Um, but anyway, th those are the few things that you know we should really be looking at. Where does the flexibility and the ability to uh, make adjustments to the portfolio and do those things quickly, where does that come into the investment process? And how critical is it that you have an open architecture platform where you really can be nimble and take advantage of opportunities that might come around or uh, in, in some cases be able to reduce the risk? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, being nimble is one of these things where it, it's, 
it's a tool to have in your back pocket in that it's periodic. Um, there are some years when the equity market and fixed income market are just riding higher and really hands off the steering wheel and, and let them take over. In other times, in more turbulent markets, there can be these pockets of opportunity that, that arise that you might not have um, have in the portfolio over the longer term. And that makes me think back to when oil essentially went negative at some point during the pandemic. Um, commodities might not have been a, a core asset class that you're invested in prior to that, but and, and not perhaps not want to be into it longer term, but uh, just an opportunity that becomes a, a real nice uh, addition to the portfolio for a period of time. So um, yeah, I think nimbleness is, uh, or having the ability to be nimble is a, is a tool, um, but over the long term, getting these broad exposures to risk assets and you know equity, fixed income asset classes, uh, they do a lot of the work for the portfolio, but nimbleness would be an additive um, you know, piece of the pie there. Okay, super. Well, you know, we've taken quite a bit of time uh, from you here, Tuck, and I really want to take an opportunity to just say thank you again for taking time to join us here on the Guided Retirement Show. Welcome to Modern Wealth Management. Super excited to have you as part of the Modern Wealth Management team and building out and improving on the investment platform that we already have available, delivering better solutions to our clients and prospective clients in the future. I would love to have you back here on the Guided Retirement Show very soon to dig into something that's happening in our industry that I think is very compelling and a lot of people aren't aware of, and that is direct indexing. So we'll get something set up where we can have a good conversation on direct indexing. That'd be great. All right, Tuck, thank you again for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Dean. Thanks again for joining us for the Guided Retirement Show. I'm Dean Barber. Our special guest was Stephen Tuckwood, CFA. A lot of great information coming from Stephen there. A lot of it difficult to digest. Hopefully you got it. If not, go back and rewatch it and also watch for the episode that we will premiere with Stephen Tuckwood talking about direct indexing. Starting your route to retirement. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to leave a comment and share this episode with your friends. Investment advisory services offered through Modern Wealth Management, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor.